So today's topic is medications and de-prescribing. You might not have ever heard of that term, de-prescribing. It's kind of new. There's a pharmacist in Vancouver uh, who kind of came up with the term, best I can tell, They in, in, in um, regard to diabetes and high blood pressure. There had been this term used for taking people off medication as they get older in the geriatrics world, but never really in the um, diabetes uh, hypertension world because there haven't been that many treatments that can lead to deprescribing. But so Sean McKelvey, the pharmacist there, has put on a conference on deprescribing. And so now we can talk amongst ourselves. And in fact, it was at that meeting that I learned that the Cleveland Clinic has a keto arm to their clinical program. I haven't seen it broadcasted anywhere or advertised, but the dietitian who was working at the Cleveland Clinic gave a talk at this seminar. It was all on Zoom. But um, so yeah, deep prescribing. But you know, before I get to prescription medicines, I wanted to briefly talk about supplements and nutritional um, uh, vitamins, things like that. I'm not a big supplement guy, and you know, I I know. Um, some people kind of grow up thinking that they always have to have a supplement um, or, or that the food is devoid of all the, the vitamins and minerals that you need. And I, I guess I never never really saw a lot of science to support that. And uh, so um, not that it would be harmful. As you, the old saying is if you have good kidneys, you're going to be able to urinate, pee out, you know, um, get rid of uh, any of the extra vitamins and minerals that you're taking. Uh, some people joke that we have the you know, most expensive urine on earth because some so many vitamins and supplements are taken. But um, so you know, my approach is to wait until if you have a symptom, then you might want to use electrolytes as a supplementation. So the sodium, the magnesium, adding that back in if you have a symptom of keto flu or um, um, m- muscle cramps, constipation, that sort of thing. Um, now, some people have the approach of, well, everyone should take them. And uh, funny, those are people who usually are selling them. <laughs> Strong correlation there. Um, maybe if I start selling electrolytes, I'll say everyone needs them. But uh, again, my style is not to have everyone, not to have you do something that you don't need to do. You know, it's kind of an efficiency thing to me. Um, I like the parsimonious and efficiency of only targeting people that actually need something. And then it's cheaper and it's easier for you as well. Um, so, you know, you might take a multivitamin um, and um, that is kind of a general recommendation just for any sort of dietary change, dietary program, because they're so cheap. And um, then you would ask me, well, which one? I don't know which one. <laughs> Funny thing, it was every... Um, owner or promoter of a vitamin says theirs is the best. Funny how that can be. So I uh, have to just kind of chuckle when people say that. And that that's the marketing and the entrepreneur stuff there. So um, I think a store brand is sufficient. A Centrum equivalent matched to your age and gender. Some people ask in materials, why shouldn't I take iron? And um, that if you're not losing iron, meaning you um, don't have a, uh, you know, if you're not menstruating anymore, if you're a female, or if you don't have weight loss surgery issue, some people can't absorb iron um, after weight loss surgery, then you want to take iron. But um, if you're a male or you're postmenopausal, you don't want to take extra iron. It's a, it's an oxidant and it actually can be um, stored in the body and not removed easily. Uh, there's a small rate of hemochromatosis, uh, and that's the elevation and storage of iron that you can't get rid of. But a lot of people ask about that. It's not that iron has carbs in it or that it, it has an issue to do with ketosis. Um, it's more the, um, again, being uh, careful about adding something that your body can't get rid of. Um, so um, I really don't add supplementation until someone has symptoms. Uh, a lot of questions about that early on, and I do address that in in the modules. Um, you know, sodium, uh, potassium, magnesium are all important electrolytes. Fortunately, they're all in the food, uh, and maybe early on you may need to supplement to get through a transition. 
but um, most people don't have to. Um, now getting to prescription, oh, I just wanted to finally give a um, clinical encounter I had where um, it was one of those last minute sort of things where we, the whole, you know, the time was up and the fellow goes, oh, do these matter? And he gave me this list of, of literally 30 different supplements he was taking. He neglected to tell me that at the beginning of the appointment, you know, that happens. Um, and, uh, you know, none of them really have any kind of scientific evidence behind them. And I just kind of um, uh, had to admit that I really don't know, you know, if, if there's a gram of carb in each uh, pill, then, and he's taking 60 pills over the day, that could be a factor for fat burning and ketosis. But um, most of the time, you aren't taking that many of those things. So it, there doesn't seem to be a strong uh, signal for me to have to take those kinds of things. And I might save you some money. Um, um, and plus, the, you know, the idea that a symptom that you might have had or a, a, a food you might not have been able to eat before might be tolerable now. And so you may be able to, you know, if you've gone through the transition phase, keto adaptation, you might be able to get away without a pill that you've taken for a long time. Uh, the other thing is a pill might start causing a side effect that you never had. And the most common time I see that is with the pill called metformin. It's so commonly used these days because so many people have prediabetes and diabetes. Um, metformin can cause nausea and uh, loose stools or diarrhea. So, and, and it can start after you've changed the diet even though you've never had a symptom like that before. So um, that's one of the things I suspect if someone asked me about nausea, uh, it's not common. Uh, it, um, it's, it's, I should say, exceedingly rare when someone eats the real food type of program that you've been instructed in. So, um, uh, and then diarrhea is pretty uncommon. It's usually the other way, going to the bathroom less often, not more often. But uh, so suspect drugs, for side effects uh, if you're not feeling right. And they might have started having side effects since just because you've changed the diet. I don't know why a lot of things change in the microbiome and the gut. It could be that. It could be the stomach acid changing, which leads me to my next medicine that you can probably drop uh, either over the counter or prescription, and that's heartburn medicine. It's pretty amazing that <laughs> who knew that carbs caused heartburn? Well. I learned the hard way, meaning, you know, someone told me and I didn't believe it. Someone told me and I didn't believe it. So I put her to task to, um, you know, test it out on her own. Uh, and um, it, it was within the context of us, one of our first studies. And uh, so I said, well, I, I, that's interesting. You think carbs cause heartburn? She said, no, I know it does. Said, well, why don't you go home and try, you know, foods without, you know, a different combination, different permutations, combinations. Um, and sure enough, the, she would come back the next time. This is a study where I'd see her every week. And she said, you know, I had the spaghetti sauce and the meatballs. I didn't have heartburn. And then I said, well, okay, go back, try another thing. Well, she had spaghetti sauce and meatballs and the spaghetti. She had heartburn. So, okay, go home, do it again. And so every time she had either spaghetti or the bread, she got heartburn. And uh, so that was, t that took me down the path of, okay, it's really hard for me to dismiss this as a random kind of thing. Uh, you know, meanwhile, there was this other book out there by Norm Robillard called The Heartburn Cure that basically said you can fix your heartburn on a low carb diet. And uh, of course, I didn't trust that as science. So we talked to some other people, wrote up a paper and, and published it. And I started getting kind of, um, interest in it from other people and a, uh, a trainee uh, in in medicine, a gastroenterology fellow, decided to do a study where he put pH probes, these little tubes, down through the nose into the stomach and it measures the acidity. It measures the pH. Um, I had one of these studies done when I was a medical student. I, you know, I wouldn't advise doing it just for a study or for fun, but uh, you can actually get the acidity reading all day and this, we did it for three days. And over that period, of time, well, the Greg Austin, the GI fellow, did the study. And the pH changes so that acidity goes down, which means the pH goes up when you don't eat carbs. 
And for these people who had refractory heartburn, the heartburn went away. And they, they had been refractory to even proton pump inhibitors, which are commonly prescribed these days. Um, so anyway, heartburn is a big one where we can get you off the medicine. And you know, if you're on the medicines there, you, you know, continue them for a while. And one day when you wake up and forget to take it and you notice, hmm, I don't have heartburn, you know, let's try without it a while. And, you know, the rocket science is if the heartburn comes back, go back on the pill. <laughs> a lot of these uh, kind of symptomatic things you want to just test on your own. And then uh, if it is not, if the symptom comes back, then you want to just get back on the medication. Another one that commonly gets reduced is um, pain medicines. So uh, fibromyalgia, pain syndromes or joint pains like uh, knee pain or hip pain can often get better. And you just, on your own, try to reduce the medication if you can. Um, there is that um, one um, condition called Barrett's esophagus, which you'd want to stay on the medicine even if the symptoms weren't there anymore. Uh, so if you have if you have that, you know what it is. It's it's more complicated, and you're followed by a gastroenterologist periodically. They look down there to see how it's doing. Um, so you um, wouldn't want to change the uh, stomach acid medicine, uh, if you had Barrett's esophagus. Um, but, um, so th that leads me kind of to the, um, this week, uh, one of the reasons I thought of this topic is more and more, I, I see people who are, they're just sicker and sicker on more and more medicines and, and, um, they're starting the diet on their own without consulting anyone. And so I had the, uh, experience lately of, Someone coming in kind of, you know, dizzy and not, it was first time, first time I saw him didn't really, or her can't, can't tell you. Um, and, uh, it turns out the person was over medicated already before I even saw him because they already started changing the diet. So we were in the, the sort of conundrum, the, the, um, doctors don't think diets are strong. And so therefore they say, oh, just change the diet where you need the doctor to help get you off the medicine safely. So just, again, a caution about being on prescription medicine, especially diabetes, high blood pressure medicine, you want to be monitoring your these things at home. Yes, you could say, oh, I'll have the doctor do it, but I'll see changes occur between a visit, even if I see someone every month. And I know most doctors don't see you every month in the clinic. So monitor the, whatever the disease is, blood sugar, blood pressure, the most common ones, um, and then when you get to a low normal range, contact the doctor so to say, you know, I'm losing weight, I'm feeling good, but look at my number. My blood sugar is 100 now, it used to be 200, and you know, I'm on, let's say, metformin, uh, and I have heartburn, or no, excuse me, uh, GI upset from metformin, you know, can I go off it? Well, I hope the doctor will get the drift and say, yeah, that'd be okay. If, of course, if you still monitor the blood sugar. Of course, I say the same things. So you want to um, just be monitoring whatever disease process it is. Um, blood sugars, again, I can take someone from 100 units of insulin to 50 units of insulin on the first day with an improvement in the blood sugars even. So this is powerful stuff. And Or the other way to say it is you're treating the food. <laughs> so if you're changing the food, you got to change the treatment and it's just amazing the the range uh, of uh, some, and if, as long as you're monitoring the blood sugars, you'll see how fast it comes down. I can't predict. Um, most people have immediate reduction and then can get off the blood sugar medicines in a matter of weeks. Not everyone. So, for example, I, I'm seeing someone who um, you know has a 300 pound weight loss journey, and you know is in this process and is still on diabetes medicine two years into the process. Now, I have to say, um, he hasn't taken the Keto Made Simple Masterclass. He's not strict. And and so, but I, I still see people who are doing the best they can. And uh, remember, progress, not perfection. But the stricter you are, the better it will work. You know, no question. That's why I like to teach the strictest version of this. Uh, but so, you know, years into it, he's still on diabetes and high blood pressure medicine. But that's because he's not near his 
um, weight or physical goal where um, then in that case, he should be off the diabetes medicine. He might not be off the blood pressure medicine. And that's an interesting thing because blood pressure happens usually from, it's called multifactorial. It's because of several different things going on. One of the things is diet. One is the volume that you're carrying around in the blood. That's why diuretics are used a lot for blood pressure. And one is the stiffness of the arteries, which happens over, uh, over time. So you might have been put on a medicine when you were younger, and now that underlying disease process of atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries has made it so that you're going to be on the blood pressure medicine, um, you know, forever. I don't know. I don't predict those things. I don't have a crystal ball, but you want to just keep measuring whatever it is, including the blood pressure. So, you know, don't be discouraged if you're not off the medicine in a week, like some people are. And some people are, but some people aren't. And um, the main thing is to not focus on that as a as a bad thing. It's just that's just the way it is. And hopefully, you focus on all the other positives that are going on for you. Um, but um, I, I'm a strong believer in checking not only blood sugars at home if you have diabetes, but also blood pressure at home. And I'm the strongest advocate of fixing those problems so you don't even have to measure those things anymore. And I have to say that gives the, the jaw drop to a lot of my patients because they've never heard that they don't have to have diabetes if they're type two. So um, uh, that that's a you know it's fun to and re rewarding and people like to be off medicines that require monitoring and make them feel bad too. I, you know that um, the other class of medicines the. The blood pressure ones um, have beta blockers in them. Beta blockers tend to make people feel tired and fatigued, maybe even depression is part of it. Um, and so I, I gain uh, favor by taking people off medicines that have side effects. So, and again, this is kind of a general obesity medicine principle, not just to keto diet or keto medicine um, or the ADAPT program, if you will. Um, I, I noticed uh, someone was talking about diuretics. Diuretics are used quite a bit. Uh, the most common ones are hydrochlorothiazide and Lasix. Um, sometimes these are, I, I, I don't always know why a doctor prescribes them. And these can be used for a couple different things. Uh, some doctors will prescribe a fluid pill if you just every now and then have um, extra fluid. So some people will do it for uh, cosmetic purposes, the doctor will give you that whenever you, you have extra fluid, just take it. Other doctors won't do that, but they'll use diuretics for treating um, blood pressure. And so hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, is one of the most common ones and um, for using a diuretic for blood pressure. Um, so with those medicines, you want to just be sure to be monitoring the blood pressure. Um, I guess the third use of Lasix is treating a serious uh, condition like heart failure uh, or edema with cirrhosis or, or kidney failure uh, that um, but you would know you have those things and please work with your doctor if you're going to be adjusting those things. But I, uh, I commonly take people off those diuretics as time goes on using the blood pressure as a tool to follow and then also the weakness or dizziness uh, when you stand up. So if you get weak or dizzy when you stand, you, know, you get tired or you're, uh, you don't have energy, you don't know why, suspect that it's the blood pressure if you're on blood pressure medicines. Um, and, uh, you know, for friends and family, um, you know, if they're, if they're on medicine, your friends and family, and they do something like this, they got to be careful. I guess it's kind of like, um, I suppose, me renting a motorcycle. I've never ridden a motorcycle. It can't be hard. I see people riding motorcycles all the time. Um, but no, there's there's a risk to it, and you want to know that you're safe with it. And um, uh, in our, our area in Durham, they, they brought in all of these um, scooters. I don't know if you've had these uh, in your town yet, but they, they just lie around or stand up on the streets, and people swipe their cars, and then they scoot around. And they, or No, they're not scooters. They're... Um, 
stand up skateboards. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll be looking out my window and occasionally someone will be tumbling over falling and, you know, it's just not a great idea. They're not wearing helmets and they're going faster than bikes. And so anyway, um, if your friends and family want to do this, they're on medication, please tell them, wait, make sure you understand what the medicines do and monitor or work with a doctor who is keto friendly, who understands it. Um, because you can hurt yourself. I mean, if you got a low blood sugar and you were driving and you passed out, that, that could be life threatening. And, and, you know, we don't want to be involved with anything like that. Um, and I have to say that through the years, this is probably one barrier to people talking about this, um, in the, uh, public setting, um, because there's that worry about over medication. And, uh, that's why I'm, I try to be as careful as I can and upfront as I can, uh, in the classwork and then in the class, um, ongoing membership too. Um, good. Well, so I've been rambling. Um, I, let me take a look at some questions. Um, and thanks for the comments about the shirts. <laughs> it's the, the hide egg why, uh, and, uh, I think, yeah, there's the Raven and the crow and anyway, um, these are different clans. Um, uh, let's see. Muscle weakness and stiffness, upper thighs and tingling in my lower arms and face. I've been doing all the things. Really, how long? Um, so I, that's kind of hard for me to um, to gauge without a little more information. Melody, why don't you write a Melody had a question about muscle weakness and stiffness. Um, uh, write a more formal email to um, academy at adaptyourlife.com and we can answer that one. Um, so, you know, bullion, um, you know, some, if, as long as you don't have high blood pressure or history of heart failure, you might need two cubes of bullion a day. Don't be shy about it. And it has to be with salt. Um, let's see. Patty asked, my husband and I have been keto two and a half years now. I've been faithful, very few slip-ups. He is pre-diabetic with high blood pressure, taking meds for blood pressure and cholesterol, but not diabetes. I cook all our foods, except on rare occasions when we eat out. He can't seem to get blood pressure down or his numbers down from pre-diabetes. Well, so easy if there's still a weight to lose, like he's not near his ideal body weight, and you can use some formulas, the BMI, the body fat percent, or, or you know, what you weighed when you were in college when you got married or, you know, um, so insulin resistance can occur even at very minor or very small amounts of weight gain. So, um, and someone with diabetes it has to be really, really strict. So you might go from 30 total to 20 total carbs and it'll work. So that, you know, the, don't be loose about it. Got to be strict using total carbs, uh, with diabetes. Because, you know, there's only five grams of sugar in the entire bloodstream. So when you eat an apple, which has 20 grams of sugar, glucose, it will, you know, double your blood sugar. It will. I mean, that just makes sense. It's it's actually four times as much sugar if you do, dumped it all in at once. But you, you absorb it gradually. And um, again, some of the more complicated questions, please write an email and uh, we'll get back to you about it. We might need to ask a little more uh, questions to figure it out. Um, let's see. Uh, so muscle cramps generally are from, um, these are transition symptoms and probably from fluid shifts. So muscle cramps respond to extra bullion, extra salt, uh, extra fluid, uh, and also the magnesium supplementation. Uh, uh, that's one teaspoon of milk of magnesia at bedtime for a week. And the reason I use that is that it's readily available. The liquid form gets absorbed really well. Um, but if you want immediately immediate relief of a muscle cramp, a Charlie horse, the best thing is a squirt of mustard or pickle juice. Unbelievably effective. <laughs> and, you know, no one's marketing something for it, so you never hear about it. I, I learned about it, and, oh, I don't believe it. And I was out at a restaurant. I had a cramp. I had one of those little uh, mustard packets, you know, and the, the plastic or um, open it up. Whoa, 
within a minute gone. So of course you don't, if you have recurrent muscle cramps, then you want to use the preventative, like the teaspoon of milk and magnesia at that time for a week, adding extra bullion. Um, and that's a transition symptom. You shouldn't have muscle cramps going on very long. Um, so, uh, let's see, Melody says you're on medicine for thyroid issue. Yeah. I don't really see much need for change with thyroid medicine. I'm afraid, um, uh, no heartburn. So, yeah. Great. Fantastic. I'm, I don't miss the heartburn either. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, let's see my heart rate. Tina asks, uh, my heart rate's running in the eighties while sitting instead of my usual low seventies. Started about a week into the KMS class. I don't think I'm dehydrated. Any thoughts? I'm down six pounds. I am taking potassium. So your heart rate's up a little bit. Well, I wonder, um, excuse me, while I check my heart rate, I, uh, that, I mean, I, are you using a, a, a Apple? So I, I don't really have, I'm not a, a biohacker. Um, so if you're checking your, your pulse, and it goes up into the 80s, that's just fine. I mean, it's still normal. But I think um, uh, it may be because you have a little, you've gotten rid of a little bit of fluid. That's the salt and water that people lose during the beginning phase of this because the insulin goes down. See, insulin not only lowers uh, the blood sugar and makes you store fat, it also makes you hold on to sodium. So if you're eating lots of carbs, the typical diet, typical American diet, you're actually holding on to extra salt and water. You go on the keto diet and you lose that salt and water, and that can raise the pulse just a little bit. You know, that's a minor kind of change. The reason the pulse is up a little bit is you have a little less fluid going around in your bloodstream probably, and that will normalize or equilibrate over time. Uh, or, or it might be that that's a better place for your pulse to be. I, I don't quite know, uh, but I wouldn't uh, worry about that. Um, let's see. Uh, I developed GI issues related to Ehlers Danlos uh, EDS. I uh, was put on Pepsid. The third trip to the ER was diagnosed with severe silent reflux, GERD, and endoscopy to rule out Barrett's. I was referred to a GI guy who had subspecialty. He recommended keto for its hand. Uh, anti-inflammatory effects within two months of starting all my GI symptoms were gone. Very interesting. Um, there are a growing number of connective tissue specialists who understand the keto diet, still a lot of education to be done. Uh, but, um, uh, that's uh, very interesting, um, to hear. Thank you. Um, oh, Patty, he's on the slender. Well, yeah, Patty, I don't know. I I'm a numbers guy in some ways. So, um, if uh, try, try if if there's no insulin resistance from extra weight, then try the diet total diet um, uh, change, lowering the carbs for the treatment of diabetes and blood pressure as well. Um, let's see. You don't have to have type two diabetes. That's right. Let's see. It's been crazy. We are sticking to the list. More time, I presume. Oh, um, well. So it depends where you, you're coming from. I mean, if if you made a major change to come into the KMS class and start the program, that you'll see major differences, major changes in the diet. If you were relatively low carb and then you just tweak things a little bit, you might not see big changes like other people do when they're first starting. Part of that is because the water weight change won't be as big if you've been restricting carbs, limiting carbs for a long time. Um, but, um, you know, if you, uh, if you ever do eat carbs and, um, you know, you're, you have no choice, um, you may notice that you pick up water weight. If your ring is a little tight. You have that little, uh, indentation where the sock is at the top of the short socks. Um, or you might even feel extra fluid in your belly. And that's because the carbs made the insulin go up. The insulin going up made the sodium be retained more. And when the sodium is retained, water is retained, and that's extra water weight. Um, in my clinic, I have a water weight scale called a bioimpedance scale. And we watch that for people over time. If you have medical problems, you're on a diuretic, things like that, you know, you know um, it's useful to have that. It's not, you know, not needed, 
uh, but um, I can often pick up, uh, it correlates if someone says, well, I haven't lost any weight, you know, but my clothes feel a little, little looser. I'm like, ah, I suspect this is a water weight increase. So we put them on the bio impedance scale and sure enough, the water weight went up. So the scale itself can be misleading because it, that's still weight, water weight or fat weight. Uh, it still counts as a pound or kilogram on the scale. Uh, so the, how the clothes feel is as important as the weight change, uh, especially at first. Um, let's see, this is the first week in the AILA Facebook group, uh, Eric says, um, for the KMS3 cohort, do you recommend we stick to the KMS3 carbohydrate restriction or begin to follow the phases? Um, well, Eric, um, depends where you are. So um, I think the first phase is the weight loss phase. So if you have more weight to lose, and generally that goes, I say that it's also the diabetes phase. I'm assuming that um, they kind of go hand in hand for most people. Um, let's see. So, you know, you don't have to change a thing. So I learned, um, I remember I, I uh, learned from Dr. Atkins, the Atkins Center in New York City, Dr. Eads of Protein Power, Mike and Mary Dan. Uh, they've all retired or Dr. Atkins passed actually 2003. Um, I learned from Dr. Rosedale uh, and Dr. Uh, Bernstein. And in the books they wrote, many of them, well, the Atkins books said, you stayed 20 grams or the phase one equivalent, you know, for two weeks and you add back carbs. That's what the book said. But when I visited them, that's not what they were doing with people who came to men came to them in their clinic. They were keeping them at the 20 gram or phase one until they were reaching their goal. And I don't know exactly why they wrote the books that way, but um, you'll see and your carb confusion, it doesn't tell you you have to stop phase one at two weeks. We, we don't have that in there. In fact, we have in there, you never really have to stop phase one if you like it. And you're, you have all of the health uh, parameters that are, that are excellent. Uh, but um, so that's okay to uh, stay at the phase one. Um, do I get money from French's? Yeah, that'd be pretty good. Um, I don't know. I, you know, sometimes I rely on you guys to make that connection for me. Or, or if you, you're, you work for a mustard company, yeah, that's funny. Um, you know, doctors, we don't walk around with like sponsor names on our white lab coats, do we? Um, let's see, will, will weight loss take longer if I'm only eating once a day? Not hungry, but seems slower when I don't eat. No, that doesn't make sense to me. So I really am a, a believer of the old school of it's, it's how much you're eating, not when and, and, um, how frequently so um, I think it's a function of um, just just stick with it. You know, it doesn't really it doesn't matter when you eat. Um, yes, you can go to bed and after on a full stomach, it's okay because you're not eating carbs. You don't have the sumo wrestler effect. That's the effect that happens when a, a, a sumo wrestler eats voraciously, including carbs, and then they have a method of taking a nap right after they eat so that all of the energy is put into the fat. None of it is expended in, in even, you know, being awake. So if you really want to store fat, eat carbs and a lot of them with, with fat and, and meat, and then put on the weight. But now that you're not eating carbs, you can go to bed. And because you don't have that insulin signal, you don't store the fat like a sumo wrestler does. I think that was, uh, I read about that in the book called, um, eat bacon, don't jog. It was this kind of uh, uh, thin book like this. Uh, some of those two pagers that they had in there was just fantastic. So if you're looking for um, the sumo effect, also there's the uh, l comparing different stomachs of different animals. And you know, you'll hear doctors say the darndest things like, well, you know, we should eat like cows. And you no, know, cows have an entirely different type of intestinal system. And even then, cows turn that carbohydrate into short-chain fatty acids and absorb a high-fat diet. So, so anyway, it, it's okay to eat fat and not eat like a cow. Uh, anyway, um, but that book, Eat Bacon, Don't Jog, is, is a great one. Uh, a lot of short essays. Um, 
So yeah, don't worry about how often. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, we focus on phase one until until you're near your goal, basically. Um, let's see. My blood sugar CJ um, says my blood sugars and blood pressure are down to normal con- levels. I've been feeling lightheaded and a, a little blurt issues. A little blur blurry. Is this just my body getting used to new lows? Um, so if you're on medications for blood sugar and blood pressure and you don't feel right, then you got to watch those medicines and taper off them, you know, with monitoring. Um, if you're not on medication and you've been living at higher blood sugar levels, you might feel a little funny when it's normal now. It may take time to get used to that. With blood pressure, I don't really hear that much, um, that, um, if a normal range blood pressure, you should feel okay. Uh, but, um, uh, I think, um, there's a, uh, if you, if your blood pressure is normal, you're in, or you don't have high blood pressure, you're, you're not even monitoring and you don't feel right, feel a little lightheaded, feel a little weak, add some bullion in it. I know, you know, I, I've recommended bullion for years and I know about 50% of people won't do it because it's salt. And then, so they go home, they double the, or double think me, or I don't know, Dr. Google, the idea of salt. And they go that Dr. Westman can't be right. No, use the salt, please. <laughs> In fact, Steve Finney, one of my teachers, um, says you need five to seven grams of salt per day when you're fully keto adapted. And probably if you're cycling like a maniac, like he does. So a lot of it depends on your activity level that you do, where you live, that sort of thing. But if you're not feeling right, try a little, um, a little bullion. Now you, you'll know about whether it's the bullion or the salt that's the factor, because within just five to 10 minutes, you'll see, feel an effect from it. It's really remarkable. Um, a little sidebar of how I learned about giving salt for these issues was not just the keto world. Um, we used to have a program here at Duke where people could come to town and, and for a small fee, stay and come to one of the programs uh, called the Duke Diet and Fitness Center. Unfortunately, the it's an outpatient program now, but not residential. You can't come to town to do it. But I was working there part-time. This is, gosh, it was right, right around 9-11. I remember that it was that time. And uh, one of the nurse's aides said, you know, Dr. Westman, go get a bullion cube, stat. And I was like, what stat you know that means you know emergency asap so i ran to the cupboard got a bullion cube mixed it in hot water in the microwave and gave it to the the guy who was kind of uh, and within 15 minutes he was like you know where am i what happened his blood pressure was low he was over medicated for the blood pressure so the blood pressure was way low so they had checked uh and um uh, the nurse's aide had checked and it was, you know, I don't know, 80 or 90 systolic. And so you give the blood um, a little boost, a little more salt, a little more fluid. You're, you're filling the tank, so to speak, by giving the salt. And one bullion cube can raise the high number 10 points. And so the, and you'll know really quickly. So if you, but then if you don't have high blood pressure, this is not a, a concern of a change. It's, it's still within the normal range. Um, some people even kind of use bouillon or broth uh, as uh, like a tea a tea break in you know in the afternoons. If you're feeling low energy, try some bouillon. I mean, I don't know if you have some coffee or caffeine or something like that. Um, I'm not morally opposed to those things either in terms of carbs. Um, let's see, pickle juice shots marketed for cyclists. They're spon- they are sponsors of the Tour de France, huh? Well, I'll have to look that up, Kathleen. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, the cyclists, uh, um, uh, Steve, a little trivia, Steve Finney is an avid cyclist uh, and will uh, talks frequently about biking up Mount Shasta in California. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's great. Let's see. By the way, my fasting insulin is 3.4, fasting glucose 76. A1C, 5.2, yeah, those are excellent numbers. Um, 
That's a question. Roseanne asks, I take Jardiance, Valsartan, HCTZ, and Metoprolol. Do any of these drugs hinder weight loss? Well, before we even talk about weight loss, we got to talk, di- talk about diabetes and blood pressure. Please monitor, Roseanne. Um, and um, if the blood sugars are normal or, or even just mildly elevated, I would have you stop the Jardiance. So um, there's some drugs now that are really powerful. And in fact, they have really bad side effects too. So the more drugs, uh, doctors develop drugs that work really well, they also come with side effects. Jardiance is one of those that um, uh, can make ketosis happen even when you're not on a keto diet. So you're at high risk of having a ketosis problem on a keto diet when you're on Jardiance or any of these SGLT2 um, inhibitors. And I want to just double check that that, um, because this medicine came out after, uh, you know, relatively recently, I've never prescribed it. And then of course, um, since, um, yeah, impact of those um, if it, these SGLT2 inhibitors, you want to be, um, very careful with, they're too strong. And, um, and I know doctors are pushing them for, um, uh, heart attack prevention, but they, they have, um, uh, too many side effects. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't think the other ones will, uh, will, um, um, inhibit the weight loss. I've had a lot of patients on all of those medicines, but please monitor the blood sugar and blood pressure. Um, and I mean, there's a theory I haven't seen any, again, this is the people talk about it, but I haven't seen any data about it. And even doctors talk about it, but I haven't seen any data that beta blockers slow weight loss. It's possible in theory, but no one has really studied it real well. How about let's fix the blood pressure or whatever the problem is that you're taking the metoprolol all for. And then you get to taper off those things. Um, but I, you should still see pretty good weight loss, even with those medicines. Um, let's see. If you have high cholesterol, diabetes to and weight to lose, does it make sense to keep taking a statin until the other issues are under control? Sharon, Sharon asks. Well, um, you know, high cholesterol uh, is, is not a disease. <laughs> it's a risk factor. And, um, but it, 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 right now, even though the science is not solid for using it in every instance, a lot of doctors think it is. And so it's like, it's a political decision rather than a scientific decision at the moment. So, um, would I, meaning it's probably okay, but your doctor might be upset. In fact, I, I have the idea for a new, um, uh, a new cartoon. So sarcasm here. Okay. I have to always say this is sarcasm that keto diets cause heart attacks, but it's in doctors who are looking at your LDL level, freaking out about it. They get the heart attack. You're just fine. But the doctors are freaking out about it. And so, and, um, uh, so that's where, um, no, you probably don't need it, but I can't make that judgment for you. And a doctor might get upset if you do it. Um, so my style, my approach is to fix the diabetes. So you're on, you're probably on the statin because you have diabetes. But so if you fix the diabetes, then you're not needing the statin medicine anymore. Because in the doctor's mind, you're on the statin or, or there's another pill for renal protection because you have diabetes. But if you're no longer diabetic, then you don't need those protective medicines. So if a doctor is holding tightly to that other prescription, I just, you know, relax um, and fix the underlying diabetes, then address it. Um, Now, you know, if you couldn't afford a certain drug or things like that, I mean, that's a different issue. If, um, and if you were having a side effect from the drug, that's a different issue. Um, In fact, um, my colleague, Will Yancey, who I've worked with here for 20 years now at Duke, told me that uh, he, I mean, even, he thinks I'm this anti-statin guy, which 
no, I'm just reasonable about it to say that not everyone needs them. Um, everyone who's crazy about them, no, it's normal that everyone needs them. So if you're thinking that, well, not everyone needs them, you're perceived as being radical and weird. But anyway, so Will comes to me, Dr. Yancey comes to me and says, you'll like this, Eric. I don't know why, but he figured out this guy was bedridden because he was on a statin because the statin was causing a, a myopathy or a muscle issue. And it was easily detected by a blood test, but you have to, you have to check the right blood test. It's the muscle enzymes, not, not the diabetes ones. So anyway, they diagnosed it. The guy's doing better off the statin. So statins have side effects, the myopathy or muscle cramps being the first one, things uh, like diabetes, perhaps even memory loss, things like that. Um, so uh, that, that would change the equation of whether you need that kind of drug, um, like the statins. Uh, let's see, is there any benefit to metformin if the A1C is in the normal range? Well, my endo said it has other benefits. Well, you know, so does the keto diet, and I'm sure your endo doesn't know about them. So uh, again, this is, we're now into the land of theory and philosophy and, and what makes sense. Um, if uh, uh, a doctor has never studied metformin in people for longevity, they might still say you'll live longer on metformin because it's so benign and all that. I don't think any drug is benign, meaning harmless. You know, oh, it only has good effects. No, but, but I'm not normal. I mean, I sat on a study section, meaning we, we read and poured over grants for, for a weekend um, at, with a pharmacologist who was one of the most brilliant minds I've ever met. And he said, you know, show me a drug that a pharmacologist knows about drugs. Show me a drug that's really focused and, and specific, and I'll show you a new drug. We just don't know enough about it. So there are a lot of things we don't know about drugs. And over years, often, we figure out that maybe they're not just totally helpful. So um, back to your question about metformin, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not convinced that adding metformin to a low carb diet. So you have to remember your doctor may only understand drugs or medication. And you have to remind your doctor that you're taking active lifestyle change in your own hands. You're doing so many things to improve your health that aren't related to drugs. So your doctor may not be aware of them. We don't teach doctors about anything other than medications. I say to myself in the darkest moments, because people come in with so many medicines, even, inter even an internal medicine residents who come to me today at Duke don't know anything about uh, treatment other than drugs. I, I, you know, maybe that's a little exaggeration, but they don't know much. So their experience in my office at my clinic is just mind blowing. It opens their eyes uh, that uh, while wow, you're the only clinic where people come off medication, that's that's pretty amazing. Well, actually, they also do that at the weight loss surgery clinic, but they're cheating. They use they use surgery. We, you know, that's too harsh for me. That uh, I'm a medical guy, not a surgeon. Um, let's see. Um, so I yeah I don't I don't know if there's any benefit to stay on the metformin. I, I'm suspicious that there is no benefit. Um, uh, but you know, that that's kind of the last, um, <clears throat> defense of someone who's trying to convince you to do something, right. It's, or the last, um, persuasive, well, but you don't know, it might be helpful. Well, well, you don't know, it might be harmful. <laughs> it's kind of my, my automatic response. And, uh, so with, with the, um, in the right setting, you know, you guys have gone through the class, you understand, you, you've heard me speak, you probably spend more time listening to me than you want, but you have a good idea of my style, and uh, and that's important because I don't uh, embrace or, or promote things that don't have some sort of science behind them, and it has to be pretty good science. Um, and I'm not a drug pusher, I don't make uh, excuses for side effects of drugs anymore, unless you really need them. Um, and, um, certainly I, I think there are drugs that can be helpful. Um, uh, but you want to be careful about the lifestyle drugs and you may have to remind your doctor that, you know, I have lost 40 pounds. I am on less medicine. I'm taking action by lifestyle change. You know, do you want to know more about it? 
<laughs> Dr. Weston would be happy to send you some papers. And, you know, that is kind of my academic job is to teach not only people, but also other doctors. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Amy, for responding about salt. Um, my doc says statin good for people with family history of severe heart disease, my LDL, cholesterol, and all. Well, you know, uh, I, I'm, uh, I apologize for not being in the group much this week. The reason is I'm very focused and I'm almost ready to say I'm almost done, but so it's not finished yet, but I have a class coming out on cholesterol and I'm going to give you the information that you need to make a decision for yourself uh, about whether you should treat cholesterol as a, as a disease that needs medicine, or do you treat cholesterol with lifestyle? Or do you treat cholesterol at all? It's fascinating to get into this. Um, I've watched and read from people who've been talking about this for, you know, since I got out of training. Uh, and, um, and it's kind of whittled away. It whittled, there's a lot of things that doctors do that have very little, if any, scientific support. And this is one of them. So uh, I, uh, you know, it's such a pendulum swing as well. If it's good, it must be good for everyone. And, and more of it's even better. And I mean, doctors fall victim to that as well. Um, so I can't um, uh, imagine uh, unless there's a specific lipid issue that you would um, uh, be on. Well, so a family history of a problem is different than you having the problem itself. And you would want to have a, a paper or a study done with people who have that sp specific um, situation, if at all possible. Um, let's see. The doctor mentioned GLP-1 medicines. I had, uh -oh, um, So GLP-1s uh, are intestinal medicines that um, can lower the blood sugar, and um, they're pretty effective. Uh, they tend to not cause weight gain, so it's a better choice if you need a medicine for diabetes than insulin, for example. Uh, they tend to be more expensive, maybe not covered by insurance, which complicates things. But, um, you know, let me reassure you that in, for diabetes, I've had people come to me who were not able to afford medicine or, or they didn't have the, the social organization ability to take insulin, and they never did. And the, all the guidelines said they should have been on insulin. The A1C was 12 in one case, 12%. All we did is change the diet and kind of like flying an airplane without instruments, without measuring anything, without using any medicines, just being really strict about no sugar or starch because diabetes is a problem of too much sugar and starch. The diabetes was gone and weight was lost in addition. I mean, so, uh, you know, if you want to, or, or as one of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Gerber said in, in one of our books, if you want to eat carbs, then here's your medicine. But if you don't want to have medicine, then don't eat carbs. It's remarkably effective. Um, uh, so, uh, in fact, the, the GLP ones and other, uh, I, they came out after, uh, uh, I was prescribing pills. So all I know is how to take them away. Sorry. Um, let's see. Keto good for cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I think more and more. Uh, and the um, ketones themselves are um, beneficial. But I, I'm not ready to say you have to be in ketosis all the time, you know, until the science says that. So as you'll hear me speak over and over, you know, phase one, for just about everyone, you'll be in ketosis, which is fine. Now, uh, but if you don't have a medical condition that requires ketosis or you're, you know, not having diabetes or other condition where you have to do it long term, I don't think you have to be even in ketosis forever or, you know, until those studies are done. I, I'm, uh, I know it's a, a big uh, sacrifice or a big change for most people. Um, but um, heart failure, for example, is a situation where the heart does better with ketones now, and it's rising up to the clinical level, meaning it's 
being studied in people, which is fascinating. Um, let's see. Uh, more and more come out doesn't surprise me. Oh, thanks, Amy. Um, ha. Huh. Thanks for the uh, uh, compliment. Must be my shirt. Um, I think if anyone, if I missed your question, please uh, post it now and it'll come up, uh, you know, at the top or in this case, the bottom. Um, but I think the main point is uh, be careful about medicines because they can become too strong. Um, and the diabetes and high blood pressure medicine are the ones I take away from people most. And I really want you to monitor those conditions at home to be, to be able to come off them safely or the safest way possible. Um, I guess we talked about um, the electrolyte replacements, meaning salt and bullion, same, same thing. You use the bullion to get salt and some magnesium replacement um, and mustard and pickle juice. Uh, as well. So, well, that's about it for this week. Enjoy the week and enjoy the foods. And I'll see you inside the ALA membership. Have a great rest of your weekend. Well, let's see. Any risk to stop taking a statin to test if it's creating muscle pain? Yeah, I know. Um, uh, Susan, that's it's. Uh, there's no risk to, to in the short run for, I would say, three months to change a medicine like a statin. It's not like a blood pressure pill that will change immediately or a uh, some antidepressants, some uh, uh, CNS uh, meds. Yeah, so, you know, you can do that. And um, uh, But, you know, I didn't tell you. No, I mean, there's no risk in doing it. And uh, most people would then follow up, say, three months later to see if the um, the cholesterol level has changed. But stay tuned for the um, 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 cholesterol class. We'll uh, go into that in depth. Uh, okay, last question. Um, I'm on insulin. I've reduced my blood sugars from the 400s to the low 100s. Great. At what point do you stop the insulin? Well, so I'm sorry I can't see your name. Uh, Facebook user, it says, um, so how much insulin are you on? Um, have you reduced it already? Uh, are you losing weight? Are you, you know, what's the trajectory? Um, if my threshold is if the blood sugar is under a hundred, don't take insulin. You know, because you're not eating foods anymore that raise the blood sugar. You don't need to cover the meal anymore. And so your blood sugar won't go up after the food. And so that's kind of my, you know, bottom limit at a hundred. Don't take insulin. It'll just go lower. In fact, though, I will, um, I will quiz my patients because some people don't know what insulin does, even though they're taking it. And so I'll say, if the blood sugar is under a hundred and you take insulin, what's going to happen? And, you know, maybe 25% of my patients say they don't know or they predict the other. So, if your blood sugar is under 100, you take insulin, your blood sugar is going to go down lower. So um, so 25 units, and uh, is that, I assume that's long acting. See, it gets more complicated, doesn't it? If, if your blood sugars are all, I'd say, under 150, you don't need 25 units of insulin at all. You just stop it. Um, the blood sugars might go up to, to 150 or maybe over maybe 200 in the short run. Don't stress, follow the program. Blood sugars will come down as the weight comes down. Um, I think, uh, let me know how you do off the insulin. Yeah, Atlantis, the long acting. Um, and uh, of course, then I wonder, you must be on other medicines and all that. Why don't you shoot us an email to make sure we don't lose a, uh, or miss a uh, loose end there at um, academy at adapterlife.com if you can't figure it out. Um, and yeah, the blood sugars, you'll be fine. I, I, at when some you're on 25 or 20 per day, the next level is zero. Uh, our bodies make about 20 units of insulin all day long. It's about a unit per hour. So, um, if you're at 20, 25, you cut that out, your body's going to kick in and, um, uh, and the blood sugars won't go up much. If they do, it's a temporary thing and then they'll come down. Um,
If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.